All right, good morning, everyone, and uh, we're coming to you Saturday morning, and we will be doing our service tomorrow morning also. But uh, we lost sound last week on Sunday morning service, and so that message was lost. And we had some people that wanted us, uh, that would really wanted to hear the message, wanted uh, wanted me to do something as far as teaching the lesson, or wanted to hear it. So we're going to teach the lesson again today. For those of you that wanted to hear the lesson and hopefully uh it'll minister to you and bless you and we did have someone come and work on the sound we got the sound going now and hopefully tomorrow will be much much better so don't want to, don't want you getting discouraged and not wanting to listen but i, I would i do want us to uh to you know to, to hang in there with us we've had a lot of problems with our system but we got it up and going now so anyway, I want to talk to you this morning about grace versus law. Grace versus law. So take your Bibles. We're going to be in Romans 7. Romans chapter 7. And uh, hopefully uh, this will help some of you that we can make a distinction here. Because there's a great big difference between grace and law and what they, do, and what they both do. So we're going to read... Uh, we've been in Romans talking about grace. This is part of that grace series. So if you're with me, read Romans 7, verse 1 through, uh, uh, 1 through 6. He says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband, so long as he liveth, but if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my, <clears throat> my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of law. And as I've said last week or the week before, uh, I think it was last week, Paul is talking, we went to the chapter, uh, parts of, of 5, 6, and 7, we're going into 7, but, but Paul is, 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 is contrasting something here, and he's actually answering two questions that uh, was raised, because actually you go from chapter 5, and then chapter 6 and 7 are kind of a something he separated out to answer a couple of questions for you. And one was, that was being raised by, by the people there, it, it was, what shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So what they were saying was, Paul, uh, what, grace is so great and grace is so good that we can continue to sin and it's okay, there's no problem. And the other one is, what are, what are you going to do with the law? What about the law? What, what are you going to do with it? Chapter 6 of verse 15 says, What then shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? So the question is, what about the law? Are we just going to throw it out? Or, or what are you going to do with it, Paul? What, what, what is it that you're wanting to do here with the law? And is grace so great that, that we can continue to sin? And Paul answers the questions on both of these. And one is, God forbid that we should continue in grace. Because you're dead to sin, but alive unto God through grace. Contrary to what a lot of people believe and think, grace destroys the power of sin. And that's what we read, uh, what we read in, in, in the chapter 6 of Romans. Grace, uh, sin shall not have dominion over you. Jesus come to destroy the power of sin that it would no longer reign and have dominion over you. And he goes to a great explanation to begin to explain the law has served its purpose. It's no more. It's done away. And it did not fix the sin problem in man. 
All the law did was made sin exceedingly sinful. In other words, it pointed out your sin. It accused you of your sin, but it didn't do nothing. And it held you as a captive in sin. You're held there. You're not free from it. So keeping the law did not free them from sin. And righteousness didn't come through the law. Righteousness came through a person. And hopefully we'll get to that here in a little bit. So we get into chapter 7, and Paul is dealing with the question, what about the law, Paul? What about the law? And he begins to deal and answer that question in chapter 7. So let's go back over it. No, you're not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. Here you had both Gentiles and Jews in a congregation, in this little flock that was there, and then what you have is, is Paul is saying, I'm going to speak to those that know the law. He's declaring who his audience is. Now, I want to speak to what this is not saying to us because people will take things out of context and apply it and make church doctrine out of it. And that's not what Paul is doing here. This isn't something that we isolate and say, okay, a woman that is divorced or a man that is divorced can never get remarried. They're bound by the, by the law and you cannot ever be married again, or you got to remain divorced, or if you do get married, you're an adulteress, and we make a church doctrine out of something that is not intended to be church doctrine. Now, I want you to understand, that's not what this verse is saying, or what these few verses are saying, and that is not what Paul is iterating here. <coughs> He's not establishing a church doctrine. He's taking something in a marriage and making an illustration so you can understand what law is and what Christ has did and how you're dead to law. That's all he's doing here. And so we want to keep this in the perspective. What we've got to learn to do is let the, the context of the Scripture speak to us. A lot of times we take Scripture and we come with a, a pre-understanding or pre-supposing what we think the same verses mean, and then we bind things upon people that God never intended for people to be in bondage to. It's kind of like what Jesus said about the Pharisees. He said, yeah, you take the traditions of men, and you've actually made them greater than the commandments of God. That's not what this verse is doing. We want to keep tradition and we want to keep traditions of churches and doctrines of churches. Listen, it's not necessarily to say every tradition is evil or bad. But when we take those things and bring it in and bind people in bondage with it, then it is sin and it's wrong. So let's keep this in what Paul meant for it to be. He meant it to be an illustration and nothing more just an illustration of how you can relate due to the difference between law and grace and the union that people have with law and the union they can have with Christ Jesus. I speak to them that know the law, how the law has dominion over man as long as he lives. What's he saying? Before I get into a lot of this, uh, well, let me go through this, and then I'm going to get into some other things here. What, what is he saying here, that, that the law will have dominion over a man as long as he lives? If you're under law, law reigns, it rules, it has dominion over you. For a woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband. That's what the law says. You're bound, you cannot be free, you're married to that man. That is the law, that is correct. But if the husband be dead, she is what? Loose from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another, she shall be called an adulteress. Under the law, that's right. The law bound them to one person. If she was, if she was uh, married to someone else, they, the label was, you are an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no longer an adulteress though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, also, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should be made married to another. All Paul's doing is taking marriage and using it as an illustration to show how you are dead to the law. You've died to law, you're alive unto Christ. 
You're dead, you died, that loosed you from law. But now you're married under, under Christ Jesus. You've been joined, there's a union there with someone else. I'm gonna read you some things. And actually, I wanna, I wanna show you the difference between the old and the new covenant. This isn't our, all the differences, obviously, but there's 32 of them here that I wanna share with you. And I want you to understand the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. And I'm going to pause and read a couple of these and maybe uh, talk just a moment on them as we go through. One, the old covenant came by Moses while the new covenant came by Jesus Christ. That's in John 1.17. The old covenant leads to death. In other words, it kills while the new covenant gives life. Let me read that to you in 2 Corinthians 3 and 6. 2 Corinthians 3 and 6 says, who is also, who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but the but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. The letter killeth. That's the difference. The old covenant kills, the new covenant gives life. The old covenant was ended by Jesus Christ, Romans 10, 4. Let me read that to you. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. That's the end. It's done. It's over. I want to establish, I want you to understand the old covenant is done with. We don't need to try to keep it in force today because it's not in force. The old covenant ended by Jesus Christ, Romans 10, 4, while the new covenant was established by Jesus Christ, Hebrews 8, 6. We're going to go over and read in Hebrews 8, 6 a little bit later. The old covenant enslaves, Galatians 5, 1. What it, what it basically is saying there in Galatians 5, 1, why do you want to go back? under the beggarly elements? Why do you want to go back into law? Why do you want to go back into bondage again and be enslaved? That's Galatians 5.1. While the new covenant makes man free. In other words, it gives freedom. Go with me to John chapter 8. I want to read verses 32 through 36. And you shall know the truth. This is Jesus talking. And the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, we be Abraham's seed. And were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou you shall, you shall be made free? And Jesus answered them, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever commit a sin is a servant of sin. Whosoever commit a sin is a servant of sin. That's Romans 6. Whom do you yield your members to? If you yield your members as a servant of sin, then you're going to serve sin. If it's obedience unto righteousness, then you're going to serve righteousness. That's what he's saying. Jesus made the statement. What the Pharaoh, what these, uh, what they were saying was, were Abraham's seed were free already. They was under the rule of the Roman Empire at the time, but they're saying were Abraham's seed were free. What they're doing is trusting. <coughs> to their lineage and trusting to the law that they have been made free. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. You're a servant to sin. You're bound up in bondage. And you're not free. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. He understood they was Abraham's seed, if you want to go on down and read it. But what he's saying to them is, you're not free. The law never made you free. And you being a child of Abraham, from the lineage of Abraham, never made you free. The truth, I will set you free, is what Jesus was saying. How much better is the new covenant than the old covenant? Five, the old covenant leaves man imperfect. 
Let me just tell you, while the new covenant leaves man perfect, how does it make us imperfect? In Hebrews 7, 19, he says, for the law made nothing perfect. Listen, the law made nothing perfect. Number six, the old covenant exposed the sin, Galatians 3, 19, while the new covenant covers sin, Romans 4, 1 through 8. The old covenant cannot give life, 2 Corinthians 3, 7, while the new covenant gives life, Galatians 3, 11 and Galatians 6, 8. The old covenant cannot give life, 2 Corinthians, I just read that, didn't I? Number eight, the old covenant was abolished while the new covenant is enforced. Let me read to you Ephesians 2.15 Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make himself a twain, one new man, so making peace. He's talking about, about uh, he's talking about when he abolished that wall between Jews and Gentiles, and he said, no, now we're one body. But listen to what he said. He abolished in his flesh. In other words, when he went to Calvary and when he died upon that cross, <coughs> let me go back. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> let me go back just a moment. It's the life that he lived because he alone lived a righteous and holy life without sin. And so it was the life that he lived that made him a worthy sacrifice because no sin was found in him. And in so doing, he fulfilled the law and he fulfilled the duties of the law and he died upon Calvary that he might what? That he might free you and I. And the Bible says here, he abolished the law of commandments. What's he talking about? He's talking about the Ten Commandments. He's talking about what God gave Moses on Mount Sinai. He's talking about that earthly tabernacle that they built. It's all done away with. The civil laws, the religious laws, their social laws, their priestly laws, their sacrificial laws, their, their feast day laws, all of it abolished. That's what he's talking about. It's abolished. It's no more. It's faded away. It's gone. But some people want to keep the law in force. He says here he abolished the enmity, even the law of commandments. How was it contained? In ordinances. And people want to take and bind things on people and keep them in bondage. It's a very works mentality that, that a lot of times people can have. Number nine, the old covenant brings a curse, Galatians 3.10. While the new covenant redeems from curse, Galatians 3.13. In the old covenant, living is by works. While in the new covenant, living is by faith, Galatians 3.10 and 11. The old covenant is a shadow, Colossians 3.2.14 and 17. We'll go read some of that here in a little while. While the new covenant is the reality, Hebrews 10, 1 through 18. The old covenant is covered by glory. The, the old covenant is a covered glory. While the new covenant is glory uncovered, 2 Corinthians 3, 13. The old covenant had many high priests, Hebrews 7, 23. While the new covenant has only one high priest, Jesus Christ, Hebrews 7, 24 and 28. The Old Covenant had an earthly priest, Hebrews 5, 1 through 4, while the New Covenant has a heavenly priest, Hebrews 9, 24, and chapter 10, verse 12 of Hebrews. The Old Covenant makes priests by law, while the New Covenant makes priests by oath, Hebrews 7, 12, and 28. The Old Covenant had earthly tabernacle, Hebrews 9 and 2, while the New Covenant has a heavenly tabernacle, Hebrews 8 and 2. The old covenant priesthood was in the lineage of Aaron or the Aaron priesthood, while the new covenant priesthood is in the Melchizedek lineage or the Melchizedek priesthood, Hebrews 7, verses 11 and 21. In the old covenant priests, the high priests were sinners, Hebrews 5, 1 through 4. While in the new covenant, the priest has no sin, Jesus Christ, Hebrews 7, 26. 
The old covenant was fulfilled, Matthew 5, verses 17 and 18. While the new covenant is now in force, Hebrews 8, 6 and Hebrews 10, 9. In the old, the law was written in stone tablets. While in the new covenant, the law is written in the people's hearts, Jeremiah 31, 33. And we're going to read more about that here in a moment in Hebrews 2. In the old covenant, in the old, the Ark of the Covenant was present as a sign of salvation, while in the New Covenant, salvation is by grace through faith. The Old Covenant demands works or a doing, while the New Covenant only demands obedience. The Old Covenant is a covenant of letter, while the New Covenant is a covenant of spirit. The Old Covenant needed an offering for sin, while in the New Covenant, Jesus is the perfect sin offering. The Old Covenant needed statues and ordinances, while the New Covenant only needs one's heart. We just read where he abolished the commandments of ordinances. In the Old Covenant, the tabernacle was made with hands, while the New Covenant, the tabernacle is made without hands. In the Old Covenant, remembrance of sin was done yearly, while in the New Covenant, forgiveness and washing away of sin was done once and for all. The Old Covenant remembers sin, Hebrews 10 and 3, while the New Covenant does not remember sin, Hebrews 8 and 12, and Hebrews 10, 17. The Old Covenant is a ministry of death, while the New Covenant is a ministry of life, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 6 and 7. The Old Covenant is written with ink, while the New Covenant is written with the Spirit of God, 2 Corinthians 3, 3. The Old Covenant is for Israelites only, Deuteronomy verses seven, chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. While the new covenant is for all men. Luke 22 and 20. Why did I read that? Because I want you to understand that the law is over. The law is done. The law is gone. And so much of the time what Christians begin to do is we try to live under law. And God never intended for us to be under law. So there, when there's law, there's always works. And it's I've got to work out my salvation. I've got to work. I've got to do something to make myself right for God. I've got to work my way into heaven. <coughs> and that's not how grace works. I want you to understand some things. And I want you to understand that grace and law are contrary one to the other. And grace and law don't mix. And you can't take some of the stuff from law and put it in with grace and think that you got, them, you got it right. It's like water and oil. They do not mix. Take your Bibles and go with me now to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2. Oh, no, Hebrews chapter 8. I am so sorry. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews 8. We're going to start in verse 6. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry. Talking about Jesus. By how much also... He is the mediator of what? A better covenant. Which was established upon better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. All he's saying here is he's contrasting the old covenant with the new covenant. And he said there's fault found with the old covenant. And the reason there's fault found with it because it cannot give you life. All it does is bring you into bondage and hold you there and keeps you in death. That's why Paul goes to <clears throat> chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8 of Romans. He's shown you where sin came from. He's shown you what the law does. He shows how sin has dominion and is reigning. He shows you how the law is holding you there. But in chapter 8, he shows you how you're free by the law of grace. So fault has been found with the law. Why would you want to go back? 
Why would you want to keep any portion of the law? When the, when the second covenant, the, the new covenant is a better covenant and it's built upon better promises. Let me, let me just tell you this. Go to, if you want to, I think it's in Deuteronomy. I think it's in Deuteronomy 28. Chapter 28, where they passed through the two mountains, and on one side there was the blessings pronounced, and upon the other side all the curses were pronounced. In other words, that law is, if you do this, God will bless you with this. You do this, God will bless you with this. That same mentality is still with people today. If I do this, God will bless me. No, that's not right. The blessings come to God through Jesus Christ. And the blessings come to you based upon what Jesus has did. And the blessings come to you because of who God is and out of the goodness of his heart and because of in whom you have believed. That's the only way blessings come to you. Because in whom you have believed. And because of the goodness and the mercy and the kindness and the love of the Father's heart. And because of what Jesus did. You're being blessed because of Jesus. Verse 8. For finding fault with them. The old law wasn't good enough. Finding fault with them. He saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will... Make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. This is Jeremiah 31.30. I think it's 31.30. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant. I regarded them not. Said, you want the old law? You have to keep it. The problem is you can't keep it because we're sinful people and we needed something to cleanse us from the inside out. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and I will write them up in their heart and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. What's he telling us here? He said, I tell you what, what I did before was I wrote my law upon tablets of stone and that's outside of you and I want you to physically go out there and go through the motions to keep it. You cannot keep it. It's just going through the motions of sin. But he says, what I'm going to do is I, by my spirit, will write my law in your mind. So the spirit of your mind is going to change. I will write them upon the tables of your heart, and you're going to know me in a relational, intimate way. You're not going to know me the way they once knew me. You're going to know me in a relational way. Well, let me go back to Romans. Just hold your place there for a moment. Let me go back to Romans 7 because I think this is important that we grasp this and get a hold of this. Know you not, brethren, I speak to them that know the law, how the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. But if a woman which has a husband by, is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth, but if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So that if her husband live, but she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress. Lost my place, hang on. Though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, also you are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him that is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Under the law, you cannot bring forth fruit. <coughs> That's the problem. Because you don't know the Lord. 
in that intimate relational way that God wants you to know Him. He wants you to know Him. <coughs> Excuse me. And He's using that word. He's wanting you to know Him the way Adam knew Eve. In other words, He got to know her. And He became intimate with her. And he became relational with her. And while this chapter, this first six verses is telling you and I, it's the same thing we're reading over in Hebrews. It's what? That is dead. You have died unto sin. Therefore, you've died unto the law. You was buried with Jesus, and now you've been risen with him. Now you've been joined to another. And this is what God means. I will write my law into their minds and into their hearts. And all shall know me. They will all know me. The way Adam knew. It's about annoying. It isn't, it isn't me saying, well, do you know, uh, let me try to explain this. It isn't, well, do you know it's going to rain? Do you, do, let, let me get a better explanation. Uh, it would be like uh, me saying, uh, do you know I got size, you got to have size 14 tires on that particular hub? Yeah, I know that. It isn't that. It isn't some head knowledge thing. To know here in this text in Hebrews, all shall know me. It means an intimate relational ship that you have, or a relationship that you have with the Lord. It's not outside. It's from within. I will write my law upon their mind. He does that through the Holy Spirit. Go to, you can read that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. He makes a great analogy there or a great difference showing the two different kinds of covenant and the glory of one and how the glory of the latter, the new covenant, so much exceeded the glory of the old. It's a difference of having God on the outside of you or having God on the inside of you. That's the difference. They shall all know me. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. The old law didn't do that. The old law was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and a life for a life. The old law, if you sin and transgress the law, you died. In the old law, there were certain sins that you had to go and kill an animal for, but it never affected the conscience. It never touched you on the inside. The sin nature is still there. But now God said, I will be merciful to you. Because what am I going to do? I'm going to forgive your iniquities and your sins. I will remember them no more. They will not be brought up. Verse 13, in that he says the new covenant, he has made the first old. Listen, the first covenant that God made with the children of Israel on Mount Sinai, through Moses the mediator, he says it's old, and he, ha he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Why would you want to go back and want to keep any portion of it? God doesn't want you doing that. He wants us to understand there's a new covenant. And it's been written in your hearts and sealed by the Holy Spirit. A new covenant that God has made for you and I. Now go to Colossians, Colossians excuse me, chapter 2. And we're going to read, start in verse 8. Colossians chapter 2, we'll start in verse 8. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth <coughs> excuse me, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him, which is the head of all, principality and power. In whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of sin of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, 
wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your heart, hath he quickened or made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, and made a shoe of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let, not, let no man, therefore, judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or the new moon, or of the Sabbath day which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in the voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen vainly puffed up in his fleshly mind. What, is this to, what are these verses telling us? What, what, what are they speaking to us? He's talking and telling us that Jesus came and did something for us if you want to read on up their ways. And that you're complete in Christ. And he's the head of all principality and power. He's over everything. And that you've been circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands. In other words, we're not under the old covenant that God made with Abraham about circumcising your children in the flesh. There's a different circumcision that takes place now for those that are in Christ or in the body of Christ. And that is the circumcision of the heart. <clears throat> because what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, it had no ability to give life. So what is he telling us? He said he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances. That's the law. That's the carnal commandment. That is, that is the, uh, the, the, the religious and priestly laws and every other, their civil laws and their social laws. He blotted it out. In other words, you're not held to that anymore. You're free from it. Some traditions of men and church doctrines bind people because they esteem those things greater than the law of God. And when I'm talking about the law of God, I'm talking about loving the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. In fact, is in 1 John chapter 5, and I forget the verse, but it says, These are the commandments of God to believe in the Lord Jesus, in the name of, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and to love your neighbor as yourself. We got to get, we got to get to step one, and step one is I believe in Jesus and what he did, and he is my righteousness. Hallelujah. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. How did he do that? By what he did on Calvary. And when you believe in him, what the Bible teaches you, and this goes back again, Romans chapter 6, you are buried with him in baptism. I'm in verse 12. Wherein you are also risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who raised him from the dead. Remember Romans 12 or Romans 6 I mean? You've been buried into his death and you've risen to walk in newness of life. It's an operation of God that happens through your faith in Jesus Christ and the Spirit and the Word of God does something in you and it's called the circumcision of the heart. It's the cutting off of the flesh. It separates you from the power of sin and from the power of the law having dominion in you. You're free from that. You're dead to it. Now you've been risen to walk in newness of life. Alive unto God dead unto sin, alive unto God, dead to the law, alive unto God, dead to works, alive unto God, dead to human effort. That's the difference. Those things have been blotted out. In verse 17, he said it's a shadow. It's a shadow. It's not the real thing. The tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments in the Ark, the, the Mercy Seat, the Cherubim, everything about that tabernacle, everything about the law, everything about their sacrifices, their feast days, their holy days, their Sabbath days, everything about that was a shadow 
of the person of Jesus, who he is and what he come to do. It's a shadow. You can have the shadow or you can have the real person. I think I'd rather have the real person. Some people want to keep, try to keep part of the law. Well, let's keep the Sabbath day, for instance. There, there's people that call themselves Christians that they're going to keep the Sabbath day. It's a holy day. In the law, it was. That day is gone. It was a shadow of something better. And the something better was what? We've entered into the rest of God when we cease from our sins. That's Hebrews 4. And we've entered into the Lord's Sabbath. It's a spiritual day. It's a spiritual Sabbath. And you rest from what? Your works. Now you've entered into the work of Christ and it's His work in your life. That's the difference. You can put a prayer shawl over your head and go pray. Doesn't mean you sin when you did it, but if you're thinking that it's going to get you closer to God or make you more holy, then I missed it. Because it doesn't make you more righteous. It doesn't make you more holy. The Bible tells us very specifically the keeping of these holy days was what? It brought you into bondage and it was something that it was a shadow. Jesus said it was a testimony of me. Let's have him rather than the shadow. Let's stop looking at the shadow and thinking there's life in a shadow and look to the person that's casting the shadow and know your life is in him. That's what he's telling us. That's what Romans is telling us. That's what Galatians is telling us. That's what these few verses here in Colossians is telling us. Quit looking at the shadow. There's no life in any shadow. You go outside and you cast a shadow. Your shadow is not alive, it's not living. It's just a reflection of the person that is living, standing there, casting the shadow. That's all it is. Go with me to Galatians chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 16. Knowing that a man is not, and I want you to pay close attention, if you would, to this verse, or these few verses I'm fixing to read. Knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, it doesn't make you innocent. Keeping the law does not make you innocent because it never dealt with the inbred sin nature that is in us that we was born with. You're not justified by works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by works of the law, for by the works of the law should no flesh be justified. That means you're to be declared innocent. Now, I want you, what we do so much of the time is we try to read into a text what we want it to say. I want to, I want to take some time, I want this text to be, I want it to speak to you. That's what the Bible is meant. It's meant for the Holy Spirit to take the text and let it speak to us. So let's go back to verse 16. You're not justified by works of the law. Now listen to what it says. But by the faith of Jesus Christ. Whose faith? It's the faith of Jesus. It's not even your faith. The faith of Jesus Christ. I'm going to explain this in just a moment. Even... We have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be what? Justified by the faith of Christ. What we get into our minds so much of the time is I've got to have more faith. I've, I've got to be justified. We're, we're trying to do the same thing. And we put human effort into faith or into believing. Believe. Believe upon who? Believing in him is our part. And the, what, what happens is the gospel comes to us, the word of God preached to us by the spirit of God, and the spirit of God takes that word to convince you that Jesus is the way, <coughs> that he is the son of God that he was born of a virgin, that he was the word from the beginning, and that he created all things for his glory. He came into the world. He was made flesh and blood. And what did he do? He hung upon a cross and tasted death for every man. That is the faith of Jesus. 
It was his faith in him as he walked upon the earth, trusting the Father and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. It was his faith when he hung upon that cross and he trusted the Father. If I die, Lord, uh, uh, Father, I believe, I trust that you're going to raise me from the dead. That's his faith, not yours. What does he tell us to do? By the faith of Jesus, even we have believed in Jesus. That's our part. In other words, we're convinced by the Holy Spirit to believe in Jesus. And what happens when we believe in Jesus? That operation of faith takes place that I read in Colossians 2, and something happens in you. And the nature of sin becomes powerless because of why? Because of the life of Christ that is now birthed in you. We'll get into that more later on here in a couple of weeks. I want you to understand where your power to cease from sin comes from. do not come from keeping the law. Because it says here you're not justified by works of the law. You can't, be, you can't be declared innocent because all the law did was condemn. That's why so many churches that are so works oriented can't help people because all they're doing is accusing them. Like taking Romans 7, the first three or four verses there, and saying, well, you've got a divorce. You can't do nothing. You're just stuck in the church here, but you're going to die and go to hell if you get remarried. And yet all the time, they're sitting there because they have a works-oriented mind lusting after other people's wives or husbands. Because they're not free. Because that, that law cannot free you from that. That takes the power of God's grace through Jesus Christ working something in you. Verse 17. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am what? Dead to the law. He says it again. That I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I live in the flesh, now listen to what he says, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Verse 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. <clears throat> Let me tell you why it don't work for some of y'all. It's because you're trying to take law and mix it with grace. <clears throat> That doesn't work. And that's what Paul's telling these people. You're trying to keep law and grace isn't working in your life. And you're frustrating the grace of God. And the grace of God cannot work if you're seeking to be justified by law. By the things that you're doing. By going back and wanting to keep parts of the law. <clears throat> do you understand what I'm saying? I hope you do. I hope I'm making it clear enough. You can't be justified there. And grace cannot work there because your faith is in what you're doing and not in whom you and not in Jesus in whom you're believing and trusting. The life I now live, Paul says, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Not by your faith, but by the faith of the Son of God who lives and moves in your being. And there's a whole lot of difference. I don't know if I'm going to get through this, but I'm going to try real quickly. Chapter 3, verse 3. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? What's he telling them? You're going to start living your life in the Spirit, but you want to go back under law. That's what he's telling them. Serve God in the flesh, doing the rituals, doing the ceremonies, following traditions of men, and trying to keep commandments of the law. No, you're not going to be made perfect there. <clears throat> Verse 10, chapter 3 of Galatians. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. 
For it is written, Cursed be everyone that continueth not in the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident. For the just shall what? Live by faith. For the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. What's he telling us? You want to live under the law, there's a curse under the law. And we wonder why we cannot be free and why we're so oppressed all the time. God wants you and I free from law. And he wants us to understand that it's a walk of faith, it's a journey of faith, it's a, it's a journey of trusting our Lord and our Savior. <clears throat> Verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Why would I want to go back and live there? We've been redeemed from all the judgment and the curses the law could ever bring upon us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. But he goes to show that the blessing of Abraham came upon those that had what? Belief and faith. Because Jesus, what? He hung upon a tree. And he took that curse from us so we don't have to be under law or under the curse. We're free. I like free. Verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgression. Till the seed should come. That seed is Jesus Christ. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. The promise was made to Abraham. And a covenant was made to Abraham that in his seed, speaking of Jesus, that all the nations of the world would be blessed because now life is offered to all nations of the world. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Let me go on down. I'm going to run out of time here. Chapter 4. Verse 9, but now after that you, I mean Galatians, by the way. But now after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements wherein you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days. That's their Sabbath days. The feast days. Their holy days. Where they offered sacrifices. When, when on the Sabbath day, every seventh day, the Saturday. They observed it. Listen to what he's saying. You observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. What's he telling them? You've been known of God. Now what you're doing is you're going back into law. You're desiring people are pulling you back into, the, into keeping these holy days and feast days the way they once did under the law. And he's saying you're free from it. Why do you want to go back and be in bondage again? We shouldn't want that. He goes on down through here and he gives us another illustration between Sit and Hagar. Between the heavenly Jerusalem and the earthly Jerusalem. Between Ishmael and between Isaac. An illustration. He's trying to get something across. I don't have time to read it all. I'm running out of time. So I'm going to kind of summarize this real quick and hit a couple of verses. Verse 23. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory, for these are the what? The two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. What happened on Mount Sinai? Moses takes a trip up the mountain. God meets him there. He writes 10 commandments in a tablet of stone. He gives him a pattern for the tabernacle. And he says, this is the pattern of the heavenly. The real deal is the heavenly Jerusalem. The real law is in who? It's in God himself. It's spiritual. It's heavenly. A contrast. These are the two covenants. One will put you in bondage. The other one sets you free. Verse 25, and this is Agar, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. What's he saying? He said the earthly Jerusalem, the earthly Jerusalem, where the temple was, 
where the sacrifices was, where the observances was of the holy days, the feast days, the animal sacrifices, the priestly laws, the civil laws, religious, all of it. And what's he saying? He's saying that which is of the earth is in bondage with her children. That's to all of those that was observing the law. At that time, it was of the Jewish people. What's amazing to me is how people today want to go back and be under law. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. In other words, that earthly Jerusalem there made a covenant with the, the Abrahamic, Abraham seed and they became in bondage. But yet the Jerusalem, which is above Mount Zion, the covenant that God made with Jesus and her children are free, free from sin and free from law. Got to hurry. Verse 30. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with son of the free woman. Which one do you want? You want the law of Moses and the covenant that God made with Israel? Or do you want the law of Jesus Christ and the covenant that God made with him? One is in bondage, one is free. That's what he's saying. And then he says, cast this one out, the, the bondwoman, the covenant that was made here, because they will not be an heir with the free woman. Your inheritance comes through Jesus, not through Moses. Amen. Your inheritance comes through the spirit and not through the, 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 the carnal commandments that God made on Mount Sinai. Amen. There is so much of a difference. I'm going to have to hurry. Galatians chapter 5, because here's the problem that a lot of Christians have. Verse 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. That's the whole problem. People can't get grace to work because we don't understand it. And, and I'm going to tell you something. A lot of people come to Jesus and they get saved or born again or baptized, whatever word you'd like to use or phrase you'd like to use there, but they're born. They're, they have a, a new birth. They've been, <clears throat> something has happened inside of them and they have something going on between them and the Lord. And then they get hooked up with a, <clears throat> excuse me, a denomination or a church and they become indoctrinated. With all the wrong stuff and with all the tradition and with all of what? With laws and commandments of men or trying to bind the law of Moses upon people. And taking scripture totally out of text like Romans 7, 1 through 4 and using that as church doctrine when the Paul meant it only as an illustration to get the point across that what? You're dead to law. Now you're free. That's what he meant to do with it. You're dead to law, now you're free. And he is telling us, you're fallen from grace. What's he saying? We read a while ago, grace is not working effectively in you if you're seeking to be justified by law. What's he saying? It's not working effectively. You know what the Bible says? And I think it's in um, chapter two of, I think, of 1 Thessalonians. The word of God works effectively in them that believe. Not in them that is doing a work, trying to keep something, but in them that believe in Jesus and the work that he did for them. The word of God will work effectively. That's grace. That's what grace is. Grace is greater than law. Grace deals with the sin problem. Grace deals with the law problem. Grace deals with the guilt problem that we have, and it gives us what? Life and, 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 and declares you and I innocent because the righteousness of Christ is now in you and I. Cannot express that enough. Effectively working the word of God. I've heard people say, well, I've tried that in the Word. It doesn't work for me. Most of the time, it's because you've got a works mentality and trying to make it work. This is about trusting Jesus. This is about a faith walk. It's a, it's a journey of faith from the time you come to the Lord till they lay your body in the grave. It's a walk with God. 
And we got to get into that. We got to understand it's Christ working in you. That is grace. And we'll get into more of that. I want to encourage you to trust Jesus and not your own human effort. Next Sunday, or actually tomorrow, this coming Sunday, hopefully we got everything going good down there. I think we'll have sound. We had a guy come in and fix it. And hopefully our internet stays hooked up. We're out in the country, and sometimes that feed gets a little, it doesn't always get real good. We're going to deal tomorrow in the latter portion of chapter 7, and the struggle that Paul describes there. And hopefully by the grace of God. I can help you and try to teach you. About your struggle with sin. And why it's there. And how to be free from the struggle. The battle. Amen. God bless you church. We love you. And we pray that you'll stay online watching. Don't get discouraged. We've had some problems. We, you truly have worked hard for that. Trying to overcome that. But we want to. If you need prayer requests, all you got to do is just let us know. We'll be happy to pray with you, for you, on anything. And come and see us. Come and visit us if you get an opportunity. We're here on Highway 18, just uh, about a mile and a half or so south of Vegra on Highway 18. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow morning, hopefully.